Good Friday morning to everyone watching with us. My name is Kelly Klaus, and we're streaming from Cedar Rapids Alliance Church. We are so grateful to them for allowing us to record here. I can think of nothing better to do right now than virtually gathering together as a redeemed body of Christ, praying, interceding, worshiping in spirit and in truth amidst the current global situation. I pray as you watch from home, you will be encouraged. Let us not be controlled by fear, but may fear drive our faith. Our faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. As we gaze on the cross and its power this morning, may we be assured the work is finished. We declare victory. And now I'll invite Cedar Rapids Alliance Church Pastor Todd Hart to give our opening prayer. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, my name is Pastor Todd. As she mentioned, I pastor the Alliance Church uh, in Cedar Rapids. I want to thank the various ministries, pastors, uh, worship team members who are represented here today. We are thankful that our facility could be put to service here in the city and also in service of our Lord and Savior here in the community. Would you join me in prayer? Our awesome and holy Lord, we thank you that we can meet in your name and in this way. We thank you for the technology we have to be able to broadcast this service and more importantly, your goodness and your love to people who greatly need it. Lord, we ask you that you would reveal yourself to us in powerful ways through worship, through the various prayers, through the various messages, and through your holy scriptures today. Lord, many in, in our city, in our state, our nation, our world are living in fear today because of this COVID-19 pandemic. As your followers, Lord, we know that through the ages there have been multiple disasters that have come. They've tipped our world upside down and they went away almost as quickly as they arrived. We thank you, Lord, that in the midst of these trials and in the midst of this trial, you are still Lord and you are still on your throne. Many around the world declare this day as good. It's Good Friday because you fulfilled your plan for salvation. Jesus Christ went to the cross to die for the sins of all mankind. Not some, but all. Oh, what eternal hope we have in Jesus Christ. So Lord, I ask your blessing over this service, I pray above all that your name is glorified and we, your followers, will be light. Light into our community, light into your world, a light of unending love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Hart. And now, wherever you are, join us in singing Oh, Praise the Name by members of the Veritas worship team.
beautiful. And now it is my honor to introduce our keynote speaker this morning. Following successful high school and collegiate football careers, Mr. Lee Roussan was drafted by the New York Giants in 85. Playing as a running back under Bill Parcells for six years, he won two Super Bowl rings with the Giants. An ankle injury ended his football career in 92 when he was with the Cleveland Browns but that did not stop this kingdom worker from sharing the good news of Jesus. Mr. Roussan is a speaker, pastor, ministry founder, community advocate, and I'm sure he'd tell you his favorite roles include husband, father, grandfather, and redeemed son of the Almighty King. Here's Lee to encourage us with the cross and thinking like Jesus. Hi, Lee Roussan here. What an honor and privilege to share the message of hope on this beautiful, wonderful Good Friday. I'm sure some of us don't feel like it's beautiful and wonderful. I'm sure the people doing the original Good Friday didn't feel that way. There were all kind of feelings, confusions, desperation, all kind of things that were just going on in the atmosphere, just like it is today. But the one thing that we know, the good news is, Sunday is coming. I remember looking forward to Sundays, playing football on Sundays, getting ready, going through all kind of experiences and challenges and preparations for that, that day, for victory, to go get that victory on Sunday. I still have that, but even a greater capacity now. Today I want to share a message of hope. And for those of you who are tuning in to hearing me speak for the first time, holy sugar to you. You see, the word of God says every time you greet one another, greet each other with some holy sugar. In other words, every word is going to come out of my heart, through my chest and out of my mouth are going to be words that are filled with the love of God, the love of Christ. I don't know about you, but too many times in my life I've been controlled by something else, some type of lust, some type of fear, some type of want. The only thing that controls me now is the love of God. My sermon title today is The Cross and Thinking Like Jesus. Matthew 16, 24 reads, Then Jesus said to his followers, If any of you want to be my followers, you must stop thinking about yourself and what you want. You must be willing to carry the cross that is given you for following 
me. These are the words of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Let's, let's look at Jesus. I mean, when we hear someone communicate to us and speak to us and we have a relationship, we want to be able to see that person. We want to be able to know that person. A good friend of mine once showed me that in order to see the Titanic at the bottom of the ocean, because now you know that it's dark down there. So you can't just take a picture with the eye of a camera. But sound waves took the picture which produced the image of the Titanic at the bottom of a dark sea so that we could see it. Just like the word of God says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of truth. You see, when we hear the word of truth, now we can see through the darkness. And I really believe that today, every word that we hear is the word of truth. And we can see the heart of Jesus. We can see his face in the way that God enables us to see him. Let's take a look. Listen to this. So, if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from his love, any fellowship with his spirit, any affection and compassion, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among you, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hearing his voice, hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit, hearing the word of truth. Can we see Jesus? This is the time of the year for us to really see him for who he is so that we can move on in our lives in a way that pleases our Father. My three sermon points today are our identity in Christ is both a noun and a verb. Our identity in Christ starts at the cross. And now, crucified in Christ, I live by faith in Jesus. Our identity in Christ is both a noun and a verb. I remember back in 1984, the back of a bus in Montgomery, Alabama. It was my senior year at the University of Colorado. And the reality was I was not going to make it in the NFL. This was my dream. This is the biggest dream of my life at this point in my life. I get a phone call two weeks before Christmas. This man says, Lee, I'm the head of the committee for the Blue Green All-Star Football Classic. You were not chosen as one of the best football players in college. You didn't have one, a 1,000-yard 1, season at all during your career at Colorado. You didn't have any, hardly any touchdowns. When people say your name, they go, Lee who? You were more famous in high school than you were in college. But Lee, I get to pick one ball player every year. And I pick you, Lee, because of your character. I got an airplane ticket waiting for you at the Denver airport. I want you to pick it up on this date. I want you to fly to Montgomery, Alabama. I want you to get ready during the week. And when that game comes on, Christmas Day, when you step on that field, show your stuff. There are going to be all kinds of NFL scouts looking for hearts that got the right stuff in it. I was like, yeah, baby, I knew it. 
I, I, I know now why I never gave up. This is my opportunity. This is my chance. You see, God gives us and he calls us to experience life. The experiences that he gives us, that we go through, God calls us to believe far greater than the experiences that we go through. And I can look back at my life right now and I can see that because I didn't give up, that even though I didn't have a chance to make it in the NFL, but because I did not give up, I had a chance. And at the same time, I will never forget the first day I was sitting at the back of the bus and I was straight up experiencing an identity crisis. How about you? Have you ever went through one? I was going through one that day. If somebody would have came up to me at the back of the bus and said, who are you? I, if I was honest, I would have said, I really don't know. Now, if you would ask me when I was in middle school, I would have said I'm black. That was my experience then. My father was a bodyguard for Malcolm X. I was growing up in New Jersey, New York area. I was there when Malcolm X was assassinated. That same night, the FBI comes to my dad and says, Cecil, you got to leave New York right now or you will be investigated. And there's no telling what's going to happen to you or to your family. So in that same hour, my father took his family from New York down to North Carolina. And I grew up hearing and seeing all kinds of black men and women raising their hand in the air, putting their hands together, saying, I'm black and I'm proud, I'm black and I'm beautiful, and things are going to change in America. So my experience in my life at a young age, my identity was found partly in my nationality. Most of the black people, most of the white people, the conversations that they had with me, their expectations were, you're black. But when I was a junior in high school, I wasn't black anymore. If somebody would have come up to me and said, who are you? I would have said, I'm Lee Roussan, don't you know? Don't you know I'm one of the top five running backs in America? I'm flying on airplanes to Los Angeles. Southern Cal wants me. Michigan State, Colorado, Pitt, every school in North Carolina. So my identity goes from being black to being a famous kid in high school. My senior year, I make my decision to go to the University of Colorado. And I was fired up. I was excited about my dreams, about my goals and my aspirations. I was going to accomplish all kinds of things. But three days after I signed my name on a contract, February the 16th, on most of the TV channels, the headline story was, the University of Colorado has been put on probation. And that's when my life experiences made a drastic turning point. For the first time in my life, I struggled with fear. For the first time in my life, I struggled with doubt. And many things after that, I began to struggle with from that point in my life, from those life experiences. But I praise God that he calls us to have life experiences so that we can believe far greater than the experiences that we go through. And that's why I find myself at the back of the bus in an identity crisis. For the first time in my life, if somebody would have said to me, who are you? I believe my response would have been, I really don't know. But I won't forget, in that moment, I still had hope. I still believed. I go to football practice that day. I come back, I sit at the front of the bus. And there's a football player sitting right behind the bus driver, and he's just different than everybody else on the bus. When I looked at him, I could sense a real confidence, a real power. And I was like, excuse me, brother, who are you? He looks at me. And he says, I am the best wide receiver in the NFL. My name is Jerry Rice. I'm from Mississippi. And I was like, whatever. I've never heard anybody respond to that question that way. Most 
people, if you ask them, who are you? If those words are presented to them, they, they say their name. But he didn't say, I'm Jerry Rice. Or they say their occupation. He didn't say, he didn't say I'm a football player. Or they say their reputation. Again, he didn't say anything about him other than his response. His answer was a choice. He said, I am the best wide receiver in the NFL. And I say that his answer was a choice because we were not in the NFL yet. We were still in college. The NFL draft was four months later. And when the draft came, this person who I presented these words to, he was the number one pick for the San Francisco 49ers. And then 20 years later, he became the all-time best wide receiver in most categories ever in the National Football League. But on that day, I learned something. You see, he decided who he was before he was. Can you imagine? Imagine with me, Jerry Rice deciding who he was in the fourth grade. Let me be Jerry Rice in the fourth grade. I am the best wide receiver in the NFL. And every day, I'm going to walk that walk. I'm going to talk that talk. I'm going to live it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be it. And nothing or nobody is going to stop me. You may look at me like I'm a little snot-nosed fourth grader. Stop judging me by what you see on the outside. As a matter of fact, you're not seeing me anyway. You're hearing me. I am the best wide receiver in the NFL right now. And when I start going through struggles and problems and stresses, I'm going to turn all of those things into good news. I'm going to turn those things into opportunities because I've already decided the noun of my identity. Now the verb is going to kick in. Now I'm going to act like it and I'm going to become it. You see, our identity in Christ is both a noun and a verb. We must decide who we are in him and then become it every day. I've had people argue with me. I've asked a question. Do you think that Jerry Rice, Jerry Rice was the best wide receiver in the NFL that, on that day when he said it? And some people go, no, he wasn't because he wasn't in the NFL yet. Then some people say, yes, he was because he made the decision in his heart. He decided the noun and the verb of who he was. That day, the story that I'm sharing with you right now, it's not about a pro football player. It's not about the GOAT, the so-called greatest of all time in football. It's about the GOAT Jesus, the greatest of all time. And he was talking to me that day. You see, even though I said the words to Jerry Rice, who are you? Jesus was saying, who are you, Lee? He was saying, Lee, if you're going to be my follower. That's what he was saying to me. He was presenting the cross to me. He was, he was presenting my true identity. And I thank God for that. How about you? My next sermon point is our identity in Christ starts at the cross. Our Lord reveals this truth in his word. Listen, Galatians 2.20 reads, So, I am not the one living now. It is Christ living in me. I still live in my body, but I live by faith of the Son of God. I want to make this point right quick. It's not my faith. It's the faith of the Son of God. It's our most holy faith that God calls us to live by. He is the one. Let me finish this scripture. He is the one who loved me and gave himself for me. Think about that. He is the one who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, I get the chance to be in a real relationship, not a religion. At the cross, I can love him back and give him my claim to my right to myself. You see, at the cross, I am not. I must not be the same man. I must be another man and take up my cross from the Lord. The cross 
is the gift of identity that Jesus gives to his disciples, bearing his reality. I am not my own. I'm still in the NFL. I'm not talking about the National Football League or, or not for long. I'm talking about a new found life. I can see clearly now that I don't mind being saved or filled with the Holy Spirit. But for me to keep it real, it's just been too much for me to give up my right to myself, to the Lord Jesus Christ, to give up my manhood, all my ambitions. Again, Jesus said, if any man will be my follower, these are the conditions. These conditions are the kind of thing that offended the historical disciples. And it offends us, not to mention people who are not followers of Christ, Christians or non-Christians. I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of slandering the cross of Christ. Telling people that I believe in Jesus but at the same time pleasing myself, doing what I want to do all the time. Now, at the cross, I don't go through it and out the other side. I abide in the life to which the cross is the gateway and the character of my identity in him. Finally, my last sermon point is now crucified in Christ, I live by faith in Jesus. Listen to this. So I beg you, brothers and sisters, because of the great mercy God has shown us, offer your lives as a living sacrifice to him, an offering that is only for God and pleasing to him. Consider what he has done. It is only right that you should worship him in this way. Don't change yourselves to be like the people of this world, but let God change you inside with a new way of thinking. Then you will be able to understand and accept what God wants from you. You will be able to know what is good and pleasing to him and what is perfect. This is being crucified with Christ. Our Lord Jesus is saying to all of us who have entered into his life by means of the cross, stop thinking about yourself and what you want. You must be willing to carry, carry the cross that is given you for following me. The Lord did not say stop thinking about sinning, but give up your right to yourself, to me. Brothers and sisters, our cross is what we hold before the world, not our claim to our right to ourselves. Let me say that one more time. Our cross, our cross, not the cross of Jesus, our cross is what we hold. I'm not talking about the little bitty cross that you put around your neck. Our cross is what we hold to the world not our claim to our right to ourselves. The right to ourselves is the only thing we have to give to God. We cannot give our natural possessions because they have been given to us. The Lord Jesus is not dealing with sin here. He deals with it on Sunday. That's right. He deals with it on Sunday. That's what we're going to experience this week. We're going to celebrate what the Lord has done. That he gave himself. He, he gave up his claim to his right to himself. He responded with the love of God. 
and I thank him. The idea of sacrifice is giving back to God the best that we have in order that he, God, may make it his and ours forever. Did you hear what I just said? I mean, so many times we, 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 it seems like, wow, why did God make the children of Israel go through all kinds of these type of offerings and sacrifices? The point was God was trying to make his people his forever. And God knows what it takes that we got to give up our claim to our right to ourselves. Do we give to God our claims of our right to ourselves? Or do we, while accepting his salvation, thoroughly object to giving up our right to ourselves, to him? May the Lord bless you. Thank you so much for that uplifting word, Mr. Roussan. Prayer is a powerful gift. The Lord promises that he is close to all who call on him. Pray with us as each prayer comes forward to cover an area of our world right now. Heavenly Father, as we virtually gather for this Good Friday, uh, we remember there are so many people who are in need of our prayers, specifically those people who are in the line of fire when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic. We pray for the teachers. We pray for the people who are uh, in the hospitals. We pray for the doctors and nurses. But we also pray for the media today because they are a lot of people who are working hard to get the information out that people need on a daily basis. We know that there is a specific thing that we have to do as, as media members, and that's report the facts and, and help us to make sure that we do exactly what needs to be done because uh, really what we're trying to do on a daily basis is fulfill the needs that the responsibility that you've given us to reach out to people and to give them the information they need so that they can make their daily decisions. So many of those decisions, they can change based on the information. So help us to be strong in the media, help us to report facts, and help us to bring the information that people need on a daily basis. And as we do so, help us and watch over us, protect us as well, because there are a lot of places that we go, television, radio, newspaper, uh, even internet. There are a lot of places that we go uh, that can be dangerous. So we ask you to watch over us just like you watch over your entire flock on this Good Friday as we head toward Easter weekend. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning. My name is David Green, and I've come today uh, to pray to you, Lord, because of our concern about education in our society. And we pray for all forms and manners of education, Lord, uh, whether public or private, whether secular or non-secular, and wherever education is done for whatever reason or purpose, we ask you, Lord, to take each of these things into your hand. And we ask you to expose to us what is both good and bad about each of these things, and then to uh, anoint and enable those that you have selected to work in these areas so that with your help what is good might be improved and what is not good might be replaced with something better and we ask that you provide the something better in our private lives lord because we know that we are always somehow teaching someone and always somehow being taught by someone that you would uh, uh, bless us in our lives in our homes and families at work and wherever we go publicly so that we might treat each other in a manner commensurate with what you have written on our hearts. We thank you for who you are and what you are and all that you do for us and all that you give us. And we pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. I'm Frank Gonzalez, retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel. 
We're here this morning to pray for our military and for our commander-in-chief. So let's go to prayer for our Lord, Heavenly Father. Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we just want to thank you for this great nation that we live in. Lord, we want to thank you for all the men and women who are serving to protect us. Men and women that are volunteers, men and women that are all over the world. So Lord, we pray for them to have uh, your wisdom, your understanding, to do the job that you've called them to. And Lord, upon this, we also pray for our Commander-in-Chief, Lord, we pray for his health, his strength, his wisdom, and for his staff to have the wisdom to do and make the right decisions. So Heavenly Father, we pray for uh, men and women in uniform to continue the job that they're doing. Lord, we ask that you provide them safety, the equipment they need, and Lord, most of all, that you watch them over this time period of this coronavirus. Heavenly Father, we ask all this now in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, by whom's blood we come before you and we ask this petition. In his name we pray, amen. I'm State Representative Ashley Hinson, here today to pray for our government leaders. Will you pray with me? In this difficult time for our country, Lord, I ask you pray for our government's leaders. Pray for good health for our public health workers who are on the front line in keeping Iowans healthy. Pray for our public leaders from cities, counties, tribes, states, and the federal government to have the wisdom that they need to make these difficult decisions and the patience to persevere. I pray for our public workers who are continuing to provide necessary services to Iowans and in many cases are putting themselves in harm's way to get the job done. Lord, I pray for our president. I pray for Governor Kim Reynolds and her family. And I pray for all governors across the country as they lead their states through this challenging period. Dear Lord, I pray that they are able to make the right decisions to keep us safe. And finally, Lord, I pray for the families of those in government service. We are all in this together, and I pray they provide a strong foundation at home so our country can emerge from this challenge stronger than ever. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Merciful Heavenly Father, we lift up all health care providers and all those who work in hospitals and clinics, first responders, and all those in the medical field. Father God, we pray that you would bless them and keep them, that you would make your face shine upon them and be gracious to them, that you would look upon them with favor and give them peace. We ask that you would be with them, Lord, and meet their every need as they provide care for others. Give them strength and endurance as they work long and stressful hours. Give them compassion, understanding, and patience. Give them wisdom as they make difficult decisions. Provide all the protective gear, medical equipment, and medications they need. Protect them from sickness, Lord, and give them courage as they go to work each day. May they not be exposed or expose others to the COVID-19 virus. Be a shield about them, Lord. And when they go home, protect their loved ones from exposure and help their families to be supportive and understanding. For those in health care that know you as Savior and Lord, we thank you and ask that this crisis would strengthen their faith in you and that they would be ambassadors for you to their patients and colleagues. For those in health care that don't know you as Savior and Lord, we pray that this crisis would cause them to seek you and be saved. Thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayers on behalf of all those serving in health care. Be their refuge and strength and ever-present help in these troubled times and give them hope. In Jesus', in Jesus powerful, powerful name, name. Amen. amen. Heavenly Father, we are reminded in this time of distress, the challenges that we face in our life. We thank you for Psalm 127 that reminds us that you are the builder of the home, you are the watchman that watches over our city, and you're the giver of good gifts of our children. So help us not to worry, as you say in this psalm, to not get up early or stay up late and be anxious and full of worry, but you give to your beloved sleep. So help us to rest in that simplicity, that there's nothing that we can do to bring more things to ourselves, for we trust in you, our provider. Help us to be grateful for what we do have and not anxious for the things we do not have. So we thank you in the precious name of Jesus that we can 
come to you during this time of trial, knowing that you hear and answer our prayers. According to your work on the cross and the empty tomb, we are so grateful, especially this time of year. We pray in his matchless name, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. sacred time, the intercession carries on. Continue to pray for those affected by the coronavirus and those fighting on the front lines to end it. You can share today's message or previous prayer breakfast by going to goodfridayprayerbreakfast.org and clicking on the About Us tab. Thank you so much for joining us this morning for the first ever online Good Friday Prayer Breakfast. Enjoy time with loved ones, and remember, Sunday is coming. It's Friday. Jesus is praying. Peter's asleep. 
Judas is betraying. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Pilate's struggling. The council is conspiring. The crowd is vilifying. They don't even know that Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are running like sheep without a shepherd. Mary's crying. Peter is denying. But they don't know that Sundays are coming. It's Friday. The Romans beat my Jesus. They robe him in scar. They crown him with thorns. But they don't know that Sundays come. It's Friday. See Jesus walking to Calvary. His blood dripping. His body stumbling. And his spirit's burdened. But you see, it's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The world's winning. People are sinning. And evil's grinning. It's Friday. The soldiers nailed my Savior's hands to the cross. They nailed my Savior's feet to the cross. And then they raised him up next to criminals. It's Friday. But let me tell you something. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are questioning what has happened to their king. And the Pharisees are celebrating that their scheming has been achieved. But they don't know. It's only Friday. Sunday's coming. It's Friday. He's hanging on the cross, feeling forsaken by his father, left alone and dying. Can nobody save him? Oh, it's Friday. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday, the earth trembles, the sky grows dark, my king yields his spirit. It's Friday, hope is lost, death has won, sin has conquered, and Satan's just a laugh. It's Friday. Jesus is buried. A soldier stands guard, and a rock is rolled into place. But it's Friday. It is only Friday. Sunday is a coming.